want I think Tabor calls it the apocalyptic lie because there's always a time of crisis. There's always chirotic time. And then it's ended with some great heavenly phenomenon and then is brought in a utopia that lasts forever and ever. And I'm sure that's what he's talking about, though I haven't read it. When I first saw that ad on the Yahad think tank, I thought that's got to be what he's talking about there. And he's always looking for sensation too. So Marcel knows Tabor personally, went on a tour with him last year, ha has a lot of cool things to share if, if you're a fan of his. The book of his I like the best is the one called Jesus and Paul which is a psychological profile of both of them. And it's, it's pretty deep, uh, but it makes a lot of sense. And then there's the J Jesus uh, discovery and the Abrahamic faith, where he proclaims what his faith in the whole matter is. Uh, he's not a messianic. He's in a faith that he and Ross, whatever his name is, Ross is his partner. I haven't watched him, so I can't remember his name. Martin or something like that. <clears throat> the Abrahamic faith is a pretty straight rabbinical Judaism. In fact, he knows the name of the father. But he says in the book that, I know that's his name, but we're going to call him Yehovah anyway. One thing in that book, the Abrahamic faith, that is really cool and funny is his critique of Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham's theology of salvation. He does a chapter, maybe a few paragraphs in there about that. I don't have the book anymore. I think I've sold that one, but I understand it's coming out again. It's worth reading. It uh, might as well be Karaite, really, except using the traditional Jewish calendar. Oh, there I am. I wonder why it's so dark in here anymore. I'm living on the dark side. Hello, Jean. Hello, Anne Burnett. Uh, you Hello, Lord Jack. Hi, how are things going? Terrible, I guess. I saw an email come through today about murder and mayhem. What happened down there? Yeah, it's very sad. We lost, we lost a, a parent of a student. She was a, a good friend of my school because you know, brother, my soul is completely blind. Yes. That woman always um, helped my school to go to make repetitions. It's very sad. We must do our best to make funerals, funerals about the woman. That woman has two children in our school. It's very, 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 very sad for us. Tell us what happened to her. The parent was she murdered? Um, she, no, she goes somewhere, and the gangsters, the gangster, kill kill her. Well, she was murdered then. Uh, why did why did the gangster do so? Pick her? You have any idea? Was she of the I, secret um, police? <laughs> Or maybe 
I can't really heal you good because my connection gives me trouble. Oh, I'm sorry. Connections are giving us trouble up here today. It's like dial up. Yeah. Well, the it's way I understood you, I understood, I understood your letter that these parents were murdered when they were out shopping someplace, and uh, that some some girls is it girls in your school? Oh, we got to try to help you on that. Help those people. What happens to Ross Nichols? That's it. What happens to those children when their parents disappear? Hey, Jean, if you can hear me, what happens to the parents down there? If, what happens to the children if the parents disappear? Yeah, now me and my so we take we take care about those students, and after we we do our best to organize the funeral for 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 her. That is so sad. What happens here is that the government comes and takes them away. Yeah, which may be worse. The big problem is because, yeah, the problem is because the gangsters control all things, all all things, and they do whatever they want to. Very sad. The problem is because that woman was a good friend of mine too. I'm telling you, my crying every day about that situation. Well, the maestro he's talking about is a famous musician. He's famous accordionist, singer, uh, quartet leader. I met maestro in 1967, right, in Ohio. He came. Yeah. My yeah. My father was okay. organized a quartet to go around through Canada and United States to raise money for Haiti and uh, Maestro and three other guys came to stay at our house for a while. So I got to know him the year you were born. Well, let's see, I was, uh, yeah. I was 14 or 15. And of course they made an impression on me and I have their album. They cut an album while they were here. I have the album. Once in a while, I play okay, some of it on, okay. the ra on the radio show. And it's called Creole Soul Brothers. I'm winging my way yeah. back home. It's good. I still play it. Well, look, it's 10 o'clock. So let's get rolling. First thing I want to do on this, The Other Jewish Revolt, episode six, is to show you a, a picture. This is a multimedia presentation. Take a look here. Okay. This is the Chronicle of Nabonidus. Nabonidus, uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about Belshazzar a little bit. Nabonidus was Belshazzar's father and a king. And Nabonidus' father was Be um, Nebuchadnezzar. So this is an account that chronicles the reign of Belshazzar's father. It also documents the period during which Belshazzar was regent leader in Babylon. But there's a second reason I wanted to bring this up. Now, that's a really old document there. We're talking about 6th century BC. And you can see 
the cuneiform, which was made by flat sticks. Wish I could get that bigger, but I guess I maybe I could. View, zoom. It doesn't go any higher than uh, 200. I can enlarge it hugely just by you with my finger on the, on the screen. Yeah, I can too, but I don't know how anymore. Take a look. You can see that type of writing, and I, I know you've seen it many a time. Well, in Mesopotamia, where we suppose this writing originated, there were found within the last generation hundreds of thousands of tablets of cuneiform. And they were of a standard size, like a regular size clay tablet. And these tablets were all organized and in an order. And in the tablets, at the bottom of the tablet, the last line was always what this tablet is about. And I believe that cuneiform is the means by which the first Torah was written. There's a good reason for that. A uh, lay scholar named Raymond Capt. Anybody heard of him? Raymond, sometimes look, sometimes look him up at, at um, artisan publishers and see the kind of stuff that he writes, because it's right down your alley, Sean, and all the rest. It's right down your alley. Well, this was in a, a little one book of six studies called Biblical Antiquities. And he goes to prove that the Torah was written in cuneiform because you notice every so often in Genesis after a passage is done after we're reading about say Joseph or Moses or Jacob at the end it says and this is the Toledot or the genealogy of whoever the previous paragraph was talking about. So in all the cuneiform, they have the same kind of indexing on the bottom of the tablet and the paragraphs in between those indexes are just the perfect size for putting on a clay tablet. So capped hypothesizes well, that's just part of what he says. He hypothesizes that the Torah was written this way because even in our translation, we see after a paragraph, <clears throat> another paragraph that tells us what the previous paragraph was. Like it'll say, and this is the genealogy of, say, this is the genealogy of Jacob. And then it's saying that after the genealogy or Toledot was already written. Uh, it's, a <clears throat> it's a pretty convincing argument that he makes. And I think he's right. And that these cuneiform tablets were passed down from the generations that maybe Abraham or someone in his camp began to write this till it came to Moses. And Moses or his camp collected these things and kept and kept collecting them in the family until the writing changes. Interesting. So today we're going to look at the vision of Daniel from Daniel 7. These beasts. Justin, can I ask a question real quick? Of course, anytime. Just break in. I, I don't know if I could ever answer them or not, but we'll try. So with the cuneiform, as far as like a linear timeline, would that predate or come after like the pictographic? The same time. 
uh, I would say that the cuneiform would predate pictographic Hebrew, but probably not pictographic Egyptian. So then that stands to say that Paleo Hebrew would follow, would follow all those. Yeah, but Paleo Hebrew comes out of. Um, What's that little country? Phoenician. Palo Hebrew comes out of Phoenician. The uh, cuneiform language is usually called Akkadian, which is a different language. Of course, they're all related at that time. But it wasn't that it was older necessarily than Phoenician, but it was in a different location. Now, Abraham, of course, came from Ur of Chaldees, that is South Babylon. And this was used, he moved through the Fertile Crescent, which is Mesopotamia. So it's just logical that he would be writing in the language that he knew. But then, as I said, it changes, and that particular form of paragraphs, that form, critical part of the, the Torah, goes away as the final generations that kept these plates or tablets did. And then it goes into some non, uh, goes into Paleo-Hebrew from there. Ooh, that was hard. That was hard. So, uh, Daniel 7, this is ISR tonight, 98. In the first year of Belshazzar, who died 539 BC, that's sixth century BC, the sovereign of Bavel, Daniel, had a dream and visions of his head on his bed. Dream visions like Enoch last week. Then he wrote down the dream, giving a summary of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I was looking in my vision by night and saw the four winds of the skies stirring up the great sea. The biblical great sea is the Mediterranean. And three, and four great beasts, Theria, wild animals. The same word is used in Revelation 13. Hi there, Commander Lee. How you doing? Four great beasts, wild animals, wild men came up from the sea, differing from one another. The idea of the sea, of course, is uh, symbolic for confusion or many peoples, especially many peoples that are stirred up. And each was different from the other. Now I skip down to 17 and I try as I go along here to put in what the Malik says is the interpretation of what he sees. 17, he says, these great beasts, which are four, are four sovereigns, which rise up from the earth. That's funny. What Daniel saw in his dream vision was them coming from the sea. And here he sees them rise up from the earth. And we see the same thing in Revelation 13, where there's a land beast and a sea beast. Then the set apart ones of the Most High shall receive the rain and possess the rain forever, even forever and ever. Now look, did that happen? This is what I believe that Tabor is talking about. When he says failed apocalypse. But really there's no such thing as a failed apocalypse. There's a failed prophecy. 
but that's the form an apocalypse takes. At the end, there is a great cataclysmic change and a utopia comes forth. And that is to give the people of the time that's reading that hope. Hope. Now, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. It was looking until its wings were plugged off, plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And it was given a man's heart in this lion. So if it looks like a man, if, it hearts, if, its, heart be, if its heart beats like a man, then it's a man. He's talking about, of course, that first empire that he spoke of before in the earlier chapters, and that's Babylon and the man, Nebuchadnezzar, Nabonidus, Belshazzar. And then there's another beast, and we could say a succeeding beast, Therion, like a bear. And it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to this, said to this to it, arise, devour much flesh. That is the Medea Empire. All these empires are about in the same place. The borders shift a little bit here and there, but primarily not. And after this, I looked and saw another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and rule was given to it. That one is Persia. The leopard is a type of Persia. Back when I was a boy in a Pentecostal church, the folks believed this literally, that these things were coming and that there were going to be these kind of composite animals and that those animals, those beasts would come after them. And they were scared. After this, I looked in the night visions and saw a fourth beast, fearsome and burly, exceedingly strong. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the rest with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Then we go to the Malik at the end of the chapter, giving us a little bit of insight into it. Then I desired for certainty concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, as we already said, very fearsome with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, crushed and trampled down the rest with its feet. So for verse seven, verse 19, Mimic it, mimics it, except it's coming out of the mouth of a different person. And the interpreter, of course, as we will find out in the text later, was in the throne room with Daniel and became Daniel's guide. And that, of course, is one of the characteristics of an apocalypse. You won't find an angel telling the story in a prophecy, a biblical prophecy. That doesn't happen. Now, this beast was different from the rest, was Alexander and successors from Macedonia. Macedonia is in uh, north, northeast of Greece. And Greece was a vassal for Macedonia at this time. And Philip II was the king of Macedonia who took over Greece. And he died when Alexander was 20 years old. Alexander took over. Alexander only lasted 10 years. He lived 10 years. But it was his mission and his calling, he thought, to take over his father's work, and not only that, but to take over the entire world. So this beast 
is Alexander and his successors, which include the Seleucid dynasty, the Seleucid empire that we've talked about last week. <clears throat> Alexander's death began 40 years of the wars of the Diadochi, the successors. When Alexander's kingdom broke up, all the generals, all the high men in Alexander's reign decided to fight it out for all the land. And so after 40 years of war, which is called the war, wars of the Diodoki, the successors, there was finally a break. The Macedonian world was broken into four empires. Macedon, which included Macedonia and Greece. Pergamum, which included Anatolia or modern day Turkey. The third is Ptolemy, which took over Egypt and its grand city, Alexandria. And the fourth is the Seleucid, the one that Daniel is dealing with now, and the largest land area, I believe, of all four. So the Seleucid Empire was a Hellenistic state ruled by the Seleucid dynasty named after General Seleucus, the first Nicator, conqueror. And that existed from 312 BC to 63 BC. That's a long time. Let's see, that would be one, two, more than 200 years, about 250 years. They say that your empire will last 250 years, then it will go where all dead empires go. I just read here recently about United States at about 250 years and decline. And some people are projecting or prophesying that 250 years is over. So this is going to be the end of America. Seleucus was a senior officer in the Macedonian Royal Army, and he received the whole territory of Babylon. In a minute, we're going to look at that territory once again, and I'm going to give you a quiz. From there, from Babylon, he expanded his dominion to include much of Alexander's Near Eastern territories, Middle Eastern territories. At the height of his power, the Seleucid Empire encompassed Central Anatolia, Turkey, Persia, that would be Iran primarily, the Levant, which would be Israel, Syria, Mesopotamia, that would be the land in between the two, and what is now Kuwait. And there's a few more. I'm not going to mention them because I want to see what you can remember about your junior high school geography. So Lucas himself traveled as far as India in his campaigns. He was stopped in India because he came upon a people that use different methods of warfare than his soldiers could handle. Their uh, technique was so different that he couldn't make his way in India, so he began to come back. The Seleucid Empire was a major center of Hellenistic culture, Hellenistic Greek, Hellas. Hellas is the Greek word for Greece, where Greek customs prevailed and the Greek political elite dominated. Though mostly in the urban areas, you get out in the country and uh, primarily nobody's going to dominate you. Existing Greek populations within the empire were supplemented with Greek immigrants. So they sent Greek people out 
from Anatolia and from Macedonia and sent them down into these other places, these foreign places to help with their program of Hellenizing the people. The 10 horns, they're the succeeding rulers in the Seleucid, Seleucid lines. There was 10 of them. So that is that beast, it's quite different. Now for the quiz. Is this on screen share now? Is everybody asleep already? I can see it. Okay. It wasn't supposed to be on all this time. I guess I just left it on. Here. I'm there. What the, the print was on. See. Yeah. Here's the Seleucid Empire. Black Sea, Caspian Sea, Great Sea. What's this one? Red Sea. The uh, Straits of Hormuz. What are these countries? Name a country that is within this brown or whatever color it is, mass. Iraq. Absolutely. Egypt. Egypt's over here. That's the Ptolemies. What's over here? China and Afghanistan. Well, you've got India right there. How about Tajikistan? <laughs> How about Kuwait? Iran, Iraq. Here's Mesopotamia. Here's the Levant. So you've got, you've got Israel right there. Hold on a minute. I've got to turn this off. And find it. Come on, Jack. Where is that? Hold on. Okay. What do we have over here? Well, that's Anatolia. Up here's Pergamum in this area. This is Ptolemy. Here's Hellas or Greek, Macedonia. Any other ideas? Syria and Jordan. Jordan, absolutely. Here's a few more, Kuwait. You said Afghanistan. Parts of Pakistan, 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 there it is. I want to pronounce it correctly as Obama did, Pakistan and Turkmenistan. Good job, you named a few of them. So Daniel goes on to refer to the ten horns in verse 8. I was thinking about the horns identified in the first session, which we did. Then I saw another horn, a little one, coming up among them. And three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots before it. Now we're getting pretty familiar with this prophetic language, this cryptic language. I popped down to 20 for the interpretation and concerning the 10 horns that were on his head and of the other horn that came up before which three fell, this horn, which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke great words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was looking, and this horn was fighting against the set-apart ones and prevailing against them. 
I've seen this. Oh, there it is. I have seen this particular illustration number of times. And I think that pretty well, well does it. I don't think if it, re it refers to Daniel here, but the little horn that grows big and shouts and mouths off, that's Antiochus Epiphanes, and here he is. I think that's a pretty good image for a coin. And that old of a coin, by the way, that coin is for sale. For sale, for sale. And you can see the language it's in Greek, you can still read it. Antiochus, right there. Epiphanes. On a throne. I don't know what this other stuff is. I just went out to coin auctions and found this. And I liked it. It looks diabolical to me, just like the man. And Antiochus Epiphanes was a usurper. He wasn't supposed to take over the throne. But he took down three others. That's what it means when it says that three of the horns, what does it say? Three of the horns went away. Three fell. One was another Antiochus, one was a Seleucus, and there was another one with a family name there too. And he took care of them and he usurped the throne. And see, eyes like the eyes of a man were in this horn and a mouth speaking great words. Hey, it was a man. It wasn't a literal horn. No, no, you Pentecostals, we're not going to see a horn come down from the sky with a mouth on it and some eyes. This is a man. And if we consider again his title, Epiphanes, I mentioned this several times, it means God manifest or the glorious or illustrious. It's an ancient Greek epithet. Several Hellenistic rulers, including Antiochus IV and Antiochus X, I believe. The fourth lived 215 to 164 BC. That's exactly the time that we're looking at with the Maccabees as the ruler of the Seleucid Empire. He was, he was a very obnoxious, very power hungry, money hungry person. I suppose like the rest, the rest of his clan were not so bad. As long as you, as long as you followed the Greek customs, Greek religion, as long as you went to the baths, as long as you uh, wanted to watch the Olympics and people run around naked, there's no problem at all. And of course, worship the Greek gods. No problem at all. Now, like, the, like John, 300 years later or so, this apocalypticist transcends into the spirit realm. And he experiences the very throne room of the Rosh Yomim, or the Ancient of Days. And if we want to really see what that looks like, we look at Revelation 4 and Revelation 8. Because in those passages, we are in the very throne room insofar as a man or woman could perceive it. We are not up to par with our organs of perception. I understand that there's things going on all around us, beings all around us, action all around us, 
but we are limited to seeing just a very slight slice of the light spectrum. That's all we can do. Some people have a sixth sense. A lot of people have a false sixth sense. But Oswald Chambers once said, the reason that we weren't fitted out with an organ that sees things as they are, even in the spirit, world around us was because if we had to pay attention to all that all that was going on we would go mad so the creator creator limited us on our ability to perceive verse 9 i was looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days was seated his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like clean wool. His throne was flames of fire, its wheels burning fire. Hey, he had a wheelchair, see? Throne with wheels on it. All was very much lighted up. White hair, white robe, white fire. White and fire are symbolic of purity and sacredness. I don't need to tell you that because you read Revelation 4 and 8. And if you were here last week, Enoch, fire all over the place, not in the part that we read. But if Enoch has any faults as a book, it's there's fire every place, <laughs> every place. 10, a stream of fire was flowing and coming forth from his presence. I see this as a very strong light. I don't know if you've ever been out on the road at night and a gigantic meteor burst right in front of you. It's happened to me two times. A meteor burst right in front of me when I was driving at night and it lit the sky up like day and it was like a gigantic explosion. I saw a little one out here, right here in Vero Beach, a few years ago. I happened to be standing out, something boom, up in the sky, and it was big, and it just kept going and kept going, and then finally it fizzled out. Those sights were magnificent. A stream of fire was flowing and coming forth from his presence. And a thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him and the judge was seated and the books were open. We'd like to say that sounds like Revelation, but of course this was written long before Revelation. So Revelation sounds a bit like Daniel here, especially Revelation 20 and say 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, stand before Elohim, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which were written in the books according to their grace, according to their faith, according to their bank account in the heavens, according to how much they did for the Sunday school. No, according to their works. The Bible, I'm afraid, is a book of works righteousness from beginning to end. Another thing about the Bible is it's consistent about things like this. Revelation takes from 500 passages from the Tanakh. And what it tends to do is it tends to keep the theology running down a straight line and not varying. I mean, I don't think they knew what what a progressive revelation was in those days. 
because when they had a vision, they always saw the same things that their predecessors did. It wasn't like, and lo, in the sky, I saw around the throne room new hymn books. And they changed out the pews with ronceable chairs. No way. I was looking. Then because of the sound of the great words which the horn was speaking, I was looking until that beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to burning fire. That's exactly what happened to him in Persia, out there in his chariot. <clears throat> he fell out of his chariot, burst into flames. So they say, 12, and the rest of the beasts had their rule taken away. But a lengthening of life was given to them for a season at a time. Daniel sees the empires pass away, but uh, not yet. Not yet. Be patient. This one's going to pass away. And it's the last one. We've gone through Babylon. We've gone through Persia. We've gone through all the successive persecutions. We've gone through Medea. We've gone through Alexander. We have gone through Seleucus. And the end is coming. But not yet. The writer of Daniel saw, he was there to see the death of Antiochus. Because he died like a couple of years after the Maccabean revolt. But Antiochus had nothing to worry about because the Maccabees sold back, the, sold back what they had won to the Seleucids. Now check this out, <clears throat> verse 13. And you can see here that this section of Daniel, <clears throat> as translated by the Institute of Scripture Research, is in Aramaic. 13, I was looking in the night visions, and I saw one like the son of Enosha. Enosha. In Hebrew, it's Adam. In Aramaic, it's Enosh. It means the same thing, but Aramaic and Hebrew are not the same. There are a lot of differences. So a great thing here with the ISR is they are sticking mm -hmm. with the Aramaic text. And this one, like the son of Enosh, which we talked about last week, to the nth degree, going through the entire parables of Enoch, he's coming with the clouds of the heavens. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Where is Jesus today, if he is the Son of Man, like he says he is? Last week, you got to hear a very good definition of what this Son of Man is. He's an intermediary. He dwells in a different dimension. He is able to appear in our dimension. And he's able to appear in the dimension of the throne room of Elohim. He's able to be a mediator between Elohim and Malachim. He goes forth and he tells the Malachim who fell what their punishment is to be. And he's not a bit afraid. He's like, he's like the replacement for Hasatan. When Hasatan went bad. Don't worry, 
Here's the Son of Man, the Logos. He's also the Sophia, if you can take that. Maybe we'll get into that later about the uh, evolution of wisdom through the Middle Testament. So the sun in Osha is coming with the clouds of the skies and Yahshua, he identifies with him completely using that epithet, talking about ascending and descending, healing, speaking prophetic words. Does someone come to mind when you read Son of Enosh or Son of Man or Ben-Adam? Of course. Yahshua HaMashiach comes to mind. He claimed it. And as we'll see, he provided the proofs to the people that knew, knew everything about the Son of Man at his time. He proclaimed it and then he showed it. Now, the most popular interpretation outside of the Nazarene faith are that this man, this son of man, is corporate Israel, or all Israel. But to me, it seems too much like a person here. Wouldn't a Jewish prophet like the writer of Daniel, come right out and say, it's Israel? Of course he would. It's like Isaiah 53. The Jewish world says the same thing, that the Son of Man is Israel, or all Israels, meaning all Jewish people. That's what they mean when they say all Israel. But like Isaiah 53, it's much too personal to be considered a people. The second most popular interpretation is that the Son of Man is Mikael, Mikael, Michael. And Michael is one like a Son of Man. For your information, this is why Jews are taking a lot of persecution from the Christian churches, including the one I go to, because if you ask them, oh, I'm sorry, not Jews, Jehovah Witnesses. That's the spell checker for you. JWs, they put an E in between the two. There's a lot of persecution from Christian churches against Jehovah Witnesses because they say that Michael and Jesus are the same person, including the church that I go to. I've heard them talking about the Jehovah Witnesses. They think he's an angel. They think he's Michael. If you ask them, they'll often tell you that Michael, the archangel, and Jesus are the same person. And it's on account of this book right here, a little later on, that they do. They don't say that Jesus doesn't exist or that Michael doesn't exist. But if you read this book, it, it becomes pretty obvious to, to us, especially when we look at the next dream vision, that Michael and our Yahshua are equated. Daniel didn't know the name of our Yahshua. He didn't even know his own name. Certainly it wasn't Daniel. But it's on account of this book. Now that's blasphemy to many Christians, probably because they don't know why such an identify and identification is a valid claim. But it is. Here's from the JW website, jw.org. So the Bible speaks of both Michael and his angels, and Jesus and his angels, since God's word nowhere indicates that there are two armies of faithful angels in heaven, 
one headed by Michael and one headed by Jesus, it's logical to conclude that Michael is none other than Jesus Christ in his heavenly role. Do you have a problem with that? If anybody's still awake here, do you have a problem with that? I don't have any problem with that. A lot of the JW stuff, the, the persecution of them would go away if anybody would just take time to see the explanation. One thing they really have right is they're the only, as far as I know, the only denomination that calls themselves Christians that are not Trinitarian. They're Unitarian, Aryan, like we are. Maybe you're Trinitarian. But the Yahad generally is not Trinitarian. 14. And to him was given rulership and preciousness and reign. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rule is an everlasting rule that shall not pass away. And his reign is that which shall not be destroyed. This is... is um, transparent. As you remember last week from Enoch, it talked about the shedding of the blood of the Son of Man and the power that comes through his blood. Some say Enoch was written 300 years before any gospel, before Yeshua lived. And then others say, and a lot of them, that this proves the Enoch was written in the first century because of the issue of blood in there. That was an astounding couple of verses, and so was this. This sounds exactly like the one that we have at least theologically been taught all our lives is Yahshua HaMashiach. So a son of man, another Enosh, is seen to receive ubiquitous and everlasting rule over all. Ubiquitous, that's a big word I picked up. It means everywhere and everlasting. This would be what Tabor calls the failed apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And Strumkoff, the apocalyptic lie, assuming that the time of the prophecy's fulfillment was to be at the end of the rule of the Diodaki. Diadaki, assuming that what Daniel is prophesying is that when the little horn is destroyed, then the next kingdom that was to be ruling what the Seleucid Empire was uh, half the earth at that time, the next kingdom was going to be under the Son of Man. If you think of it as a spiritual kingdom, well, that's what we have to do, really. Or we have to understand this as a failed prophecy. But all my life, I've been in this kingdom where you're more, you're more there than here. You're more there than here. There is where your mind is at. There is where your dreams are. Do you see why it would be so attractive to poor people and disinherited people? I feel poor and disinherited. I maybe don't believe, I don't know whether I believe it or not, but I certainly hope. I'm hoping because this world is not a permanent home, as Hebrew says. Now, in the last little bit of time, I have, oh, I've got a lot more here. Okay, I won't do that then. I want to uh, mention to you
a pretty extraordinary book. Where was I? Oh, here. A pretty extraordinary book. Let me show it to you. Look at that. Wonder why that's so blurry. Hold on a minute. Maybe this is on blur. Ah. Little book, The Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ. This is by a great Jewish scholar. You might know his name, Daniel Boyarin. I wanted to say Daniel Boyardi. First time I read this, I, is that any relation to the famous chef Boyardi? The Jewish Gospels. He takes Daniel, especially seven, and he brings forth the Gospel of Yahshua HaMashiach, found in Mark, out of Daniel. It's tremendous. Here's one of the ones I'm uh, referring right now using the Maccabean Revolt by Daniel J. Harrington. Look, there's a Daniel right there. Maybe he's the Daniel that wrote the book of Daniel. Anatomy of a Biblical Revolution. Boy R. Dean. Take the E off. No. Boy and then A R and then D I N. I didn't know this guy, but the book intrigued me. And what he does is he uses simply the books that were written during the Maccabean period to show the feelings, the history, the theology of the Jewish people during that time. He doesn't use history books. There's one more. This is pretty interesting. This is a nobody, Bill Saxton. Never heard of him. Daniel's Prophecies of Covenant Change. Understanding Daniel's visions of the future. Now look, it says visions of the future. He says, yes, they've happened. But I'm a little timid, he says, to proclaim that they're going to happen again exactly like they're in here. And he points out how. Where can you find these books? Well, um, I'll tell you the authors again. Daniel B. O Y A R I N. Don't expect to find any spectacular stuff in here. You know, like the, uh, like Jonathan Kahn, pure speculation, pure sensationalism. Harrington, the Maccabean Revolt, Daniel J. Harrington. The Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ, Daniel Boyarin. Oh, he's coming up everywhere these days. Gospel of Thomas, I think that Gospel of Thomas, with some exceptions, it shows us a Christianity that's not necessarily Gnostic or, or radical, but it was a competing Christianity with what we call orthodoxy, competing. Where to find books? I sell books. I'm about out of them now.
But if I'm looking for one, I'm going to go to bookfinder.com. It has all the bookstores in the world on there. You put the title of it in or the author of it in, and they all come rolling in. Or best yet, go to Amazon. I get used books. Sometimes I get a book like that. I just got one, uh, Tracing the Ark of the Covenant. And it's a great book. And the, he found it. This guy found it down in Ethiopia, not the one in the St. Mary's Church. He found the real Ark, the second Ark. And I got that for a dollar. One of my aunties sells books on Amazon. All right. Good for you. You can make some money if you got a lot of books. I'm running out. All my good books I sold, thank goodness. I needed to, or I would be like the rest of you on the poor farm. Yeah, I would buy, you can buy uh, used books for uh, much less, maybe 20% or 30% of the original price that are, some of them are new, some of them are very easily used. Yeah, that's good. I go to the Goodwill, but I tell you what, there isn't anything much there that's going to be worth anything. You make money if you sell more rare and expensive books. The best place, I just sell theology books. Best place to find them is a church. When you hear churches going out of business, go pick up their library. I've been able to do that one time. There's all kinds of stuff in there. All right, let's see. I don't want to finish this up. Oh, I wanted to just finish up here with <clears throat> Boyarine, something from his book here. He says that in the verse, Daniel 7, 14, as Joshua's claim to have authority to forgive sins and even abrogate the Sabbath, if he so pleases, he says, I want to show that Jesus saw himself as the divine son of man. And I will do so by explaining a couple of difficult passages in the second chapter of Mark. Here's one of those difficult chapters that he's going to use. That's in Mark 2, 3 to 10, the story of the paralytic. Um broken the bed let's see they came to him bringing a paralytic and not being able to come near him because the crowd they uncovered the roof where he was and when they had broken through they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying and yeshua saw their belief and he said to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven you look at this he calls him son he's only 30 years old so they say i think he was 50. I think what the one gospel says is probably right. You know, there's a 50-year loss, a 50-year hiccup in the Bible. Now some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this one talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who is able to forgive sins but Elohim alone? And immediately, Ashua, knowing in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why do you reason about all this in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise up, take up your bed, and walk? But in order for you to know that the son of Adam possesses authority on earth to forgive sins, dot, dot, dot. He goes on to say that the cultural imperative was that the Son of Man was to be divine. That is to say, the Jewish people in this time of Yahshua all knew Daniel, all knew Daniel 7 and 14, all knew what kind of power the Son of Man was supposed to have. It was built right into their ethos built right into their religion. And if someone came around there claiming to be he, they knew what proofs he had to give because they'd learned in Daniel from their earliest ages that when the son of man arrived, 
he would have all the abilities and authorities of Elohim to heal, forgive sin, cast out demons. And this is why so many came forth and believed in the first century and right off the bat. Because they knew what Daniel 7 had to say about what the Son of Man could do and what authority he had when he came. And so, my friends, I'll cut off there, and we'll get back at this next week if you want. Yeah, I almost got through the whole thing. I appreciate you coming. It's no fun to do this when nobody's here. You're welcome.